Hello, everyone. My name is Dina Althani, and I will be uh, the moderator for today's session. I would like to firstly welcome you all to the session on COVID-19 and digital health uh, opportunities and challenges. The session is part of a series of webinars that is held in partnership with the Ministry of Communication and Transport. The session is delivered by member of the College of Science and Engineering uh, at Hamad bin Khalifa University. The College of Science and Engineering was founded in 2015 with an emphasis on research and innovation. The college is under Hamad bin Khalifa University, which is a member of Qadar Foundation. Uh, the college, as well as in the university, aims to fulfill Qatar Foundation vision of unlocking human potential. HBKU, Hamad bin Khalifa University, is a homegrown university with a focus of research and graduate studies in an attempt uh, and with the aim of transforming Qatar and the region with a global impact. As we all have known, COVID-19 COVID pandemic continues to take toll across the world, costing lives and bringing a lot of disturbance and challenges to our daily lives. While, while the global community is racing toward finding a vaccine, as we all know, and treatments, there is a lot of opportunity for, for digital health and, digital, and digital, uh, digital transformation in the world. And today we are here with a set of pioneers in the field that would like to discuss with you their projects, their research, and their views on the state-of-the-art technologies available today bringing about their projects in Hamad bin Khalifa and how exciting their ideas are. Being world pioneers in their field, they will be discussing their views and present the state-of-the-art technologies and innovation to tackle COVID-19 and the consequences related to it. We have today with us seven speakers from the College of Science and Engineering. The panel will start with each speaker presenting his or her research in the field. And this is followed by a 15 minute question and answer. The total amount of the session is 60 minutes, including question and answer. So if you have a question during the talk, please feel free to insert your question in the question and answer pane, probably on the right hand side of your screen. I will start as the moderator. My name is Dina Althani. I'm a faculty member at Hamad bin Khalifa University. My, re my research interest is in human computer interaction, assistive technology, and e-health. Following that, uh, we will have Dr. Zubair Shah, who is an assistant professor, and I will be presenting each speaker prior to his or her talk. Dr. Samir Brahim Bilharao uh, is, uh, is an associate professor Dr. Jens Schneider is an assistant professor in the College of Science and Engineering. Dr. Rayan Ali is a professor in the College of Science and Engineering. Dr. Muwafaq Hose, uh, an associate professor in the College of Science and Engineering. Dr. Tanvir Alam, an assistant professor in the College of Science and Engineering. Dr. Marwa Karaki, an assistant professor in the College of Science and Engineering. So as I said, today we will present we will be presenting our work in the uh, area of uh, digital health to uh, combat the COVID-19 crisis and to provide issues to solve the, the consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. The work we have today, the work we have today uh, comes un under the umbrella of health and human-centered technologies. Uh, the College of Science and Engineering in about uh, in about the last year, decided to uh, to present the focus areas of the college. So it presented seven focus areas in which it called them the research pillars. And one of these research uh, pillars is the health and human centered technology. In this pillar, we have a number of faculty which which focuses their research in tackling issues related to health and well being of the people of Qatar. In this research uh, pillar, we work on innovative intradisciplinary domain research that utilizes methods from social science, human computer interaction, visualization, uh, and more. This research pillars come to the, uh, to the heart of, 
of the Qatar Vision 2030 uh, uh, pillar, which is basically the human development pillar. Researcher in this field utilizes many uh, techniques which are uh, from other fields, such as artificial intelligence, human computer interaction, digital informatics, and more. The, the field by its nature is applied. However, we, uh, we utilize a lot of theoretical work from basic research areas. In this research pillar, we have uh, in, uh, initiated and established a number of collaborative work with, me, uh, with important stakeholders here in Qatar. And you can see on the bottom of this uh, slide, a number of stakeholders that we, we are closely working uh, with in, in a number of projects led by the faculty I presented earlier. As the session today is on COVID-19 and digital health, we have uh, identified a set of main categories that our projects fall within. These categories basically focuses on interpretation of the data, prevention of the disease, treatment of the disease, and promotion of a healthy and a better lifestyle. When we see interpretation of the data, what do we mean by that? During the crisis, a wealth of data has been available for us online in terms of the number of cases, the, uh, the, the symptoms related to the cases, and more. Using uh, modern day machine learning and artificial intelligence techniques, we could see a lot about the data. We could make sense of the, of the data. We could find correlations and we could understand the data and better solve the, uh, the current crisis and the consequences related to it. In terms of prevention, uh, the COVID-19 created a, a, an issue in terms, not only in terms of health, however, in terms of our lifestyle, the isolation we are living today. And we believe that digital health plays a big role in terms of sorting such a problem. And we will see today a number of innovative projects by our uh, colleagues. In terms of treatment, we, we all have seen that machine learning and artificial intelligence have gone a long way in terms of finding treatments, uh, for, for certain numbers of diseases. It helped with screening, for example. It helped with identifying so, a sort of combinations of medication that could be uh, a, a possible or a promising directions in terms of treatment of the COVID-19. And we read a lot about it in the news. Today, we have World Pioneers researcher who will be presenting to us some of their projects. In terms of promotion, uh, we uh, we in in the in the uh, in the health and uh, human center technology research pillar we found this crisis as an opportunity to promote for a better lifestyle a safer lifestyle and a healthier uh, li lifestyle and today we will have also a number of faculty presenting how this crisis could be uh, looked at as an opportunity to pro uh, to promote for digital uh, health platform in uh, in saving lives, in, in, in creating a better lifestyles with us. So the speaker today will touch upon all these four topics and we will see, inshallah, as this session continues. The first speaker with us today is Dr. Zubair Shah. Dr. Zubair is an assistant professor in the College of Science and Engineering. His skills and research interests are in artificial intelligence, and its application, Dr. Shah is experienced in applied health informatics, has a strong record of achievement in research, and has developed state-of-the-art machine learning techniques for analyzing social media content. Dr. Zavir, can you share with us what are the research pro projects you are working in today to tackle the COVID-19 health issues? Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining this online session. Uh, I have two projects that are uh, very relevant to the current COVID-19 crisis. Before I explain my project, uh, first I would like to give a little bit background of these projects. 
at College of Science and Engineering here at HBKU, among many other research direction, one research field that I that is relevant to the current crisis, uh, crisis due to COVID-19, which I work on and looking at is digital epidemiology. The field of digital epidemiology is concerned with health outcomes of population. It is literally the study of what is uh, about people. Digital epidemiology is concerned with understanding of the dynamics of health and disease in human population using digital data and to use this understanding to mitigate and prevent diseases and to promote health. Some topics of interest are designing public health surveillance systems using digital data sources for detecting disease outbreaks, gauging spread of misinformation and assessing impact of events on uh, people. I have uh, two uh, interrelated and relevant examples from my current research. The first project that is uh, on the left side of the slide, the first project uh, is, was about measuring confidence and coverage of vaccines in relation to information exposure. Uh, vaccination is one of the controversial topic in public health uh, domain. Despite proven effectiveness of vaccine against many infectious diseases, the acceptance of vaccine varies from uh, regions to region. This mostly depends on person beliefs, exposure to information and interaction with friends and clinicians. In this project, we collected 10 million tweets uh, about vaccines to identify community that are mostly at risk of sharing or being exposed to misinformation. And then we try to uh, see if exposure to misinformation has any impact on their health related decisions. We found that uh, lower vaccination coverage has a strong correlation with uh, misinformation exposure and negative topics about vaccines. This was an important finding that shows the impact of misinformation and rumors on people and population level health uh, outcomes. The second project uh, is about assessing impact of COVID-19 on people. We analyzed over 1 million tweets from around the world to investigate main fears and concerns of global population. We found that people's top concerns were related to uh, economy being quarantined and running out of food supply. In our analysis, we separated individual concerns from uh, country level concerns. For example, individual concerns were related to general fear and stress and deaths, panic buying and racism. From a country perspective, concerns were related to rising number of deaths, travel restrictions and economy. The aim of this study was to understand public attitude and behaviors during crisis, which can be used as a way to support crisis communication and, uh, and health uh, uh, promotion messaging. This research can help direct the messages of policymakers to ensure effective uh, management of the outbreak. This was one of the first study published in a top class uh, journal and has attracted much of local and international uh, media attention. For example, the study was a feature in more than 20 news outlets, including Al Jazeera TV and Oryx Radio. It is frequently cited by uh, researchers around the world. It was also used by governmental policy uh, documents. So both of these uh, projects are in the field of digital epidemiology where we uh, use publicly available data to study population level health outcomes. Uh, during this crisis, uh, our research emphasized issues and concerns that people uh, around the world were facing uh, during the lockdown and closures and highlighted main fears of uh, people. So these are the two projects that I have uh, led um, um, and these were related to COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Thank you very much, Dr. Dina. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zubair. It's very interesting how uh, we can do a lot from the data available uh, uh, online. Uh, as, as you explained to us, it's very interesting how you looked at the social media uh, data and you've analyzed the uh, data. Thank you very much, Dr. Zubair. We will move to our second speaker, Dr. Samir Brahim Brihwari. Dr. Samir received a master's degree in telecommunication and network from the Institut National Polytechniques uh, in Toulouse, France, and a PhD degree in mathematics from the Federal Polytechnic School in Lausanne, in Switzerland 2006. 
He's currently an associate professor with us in the College of Science and Engineering. He has, uh, he has held several research and teaching posi uh, positions, mashallah, around the world, in the Middle East, Asia, Russia, and Europe, including the University of Sharjah and UAE and the EPFL in Switzerland. Coming from a strong background in, in computer science and mathematics, his research interests are applied mathematics and statistics, data analysis, artificial intelligence, image and signal processing in biomedical, bioinformatic, and forecasting. Uh, Dr. Samir, uh, tell us how to accurately diagnose and study the spread of COVID-19 and how you found that through your research. Yes, okay. So thank you so much, Dr. Dina, for the for the presentation. So the answer of those uh, questions will help us to, in the monitoring and controlling the pandemic of the COVID-19. For the first question, detecting and diagnosis of the COVID-19 in a simple and a fast and accurate way will help us to locate and also to hold back the propagation of the COVID-19. For the second question, to better estimate the propagation of the COVID-19, we need to study the interaction inside certain population or country. So let me start for the first project. What we want to do is to, uh, is to design a fast and smart stethoscope for the land breathing sound. It can be mobile, it can be moved from point to another point easily in order to detect and locate the positive cases in order to stop or at least hold back the spread of the COVID-19. And at the same time, reducing the contact between the patient and the health personnel for the safety reasons. So the project here, so the flowchart will summarize the project. For example, the patient can approach the emergency service or vice versa. So the emergency do the recording of the sound. Our model will do the testing. If the patient is uh, has COVID-19 positive or negative, so if it has uh, the COVID-19 will be transferred to the special services. If not, we can do further investigation to detect other disease. For the sound, he has a lot of uh, noises. So there is uh, two steps are really important. Pre-processing and feature extraction are needed to facilitate the task of any classifier. So uh, data set has been collected. Nine different diseases were collected along with the healthy one. We can see here the COVID-19 is uh, numbers number nine, class number nine. So what we need to do in order to enhance and to get better, better features, we do some advanced mathematical transfer or transformation. We call it time frequency decomposition is applied in order to get a rich and invariant features. Later on, we need to do the feature selection for every type of disease. We need to define the invariant features by using advanced uh, tools. So here's the basic result. When we did just, we tested by a very simple classifier, we call it K nearest neighbor. We get 91% of accuracy in order to detect 10 different classes. But if we are only focused on the COVID-19, the sensitivity is extremely high, is around 97%. Okay, projects. If you want to study certain society and we want to do the estimation or how the propagation of the COVID-19, we need to do a little bit study about the society. For example, we need to divide the society to different categories. We need to study the internal interaction between different members inside the same category, and there is extra interactions. So let me summarize all this one. For example, society has two different categories, one and two. There is healthy, infected, recovered people and how the interaction is between the different classes among the same categories and with different categories. All those interactions can be summarized by the dynamic system with these different equations, and this has helped us to do the estimation. And in order to predict the future, how the, how the propagation can be in the futures. So this project is still under uh, research. We did just simple estimation and we get extremely nice results and we want to apply it more in Qatar and our collaborators are in Turkey. We want to, to enhance it more and more. So this is just uh, the, the, Dr. Dina how answered your two questions in order to do fast, accurate, mobile way we can do the detections and how we can do the estimation for the future of the pandemic COVID-19. So uh, Very interesting, uh, Mashallah, Dr. Samir. Uh, and it's, it's interesting seen with your work and inshallah with Dr. Azubir as well. Thank you very much. Now we're moving to the, uh, to the speak, uh, speaker. Uh, Dr. Jens, 
Dr. Jens Schneider uh, joined the College of Science and Engineering at HBKU in December of 2018. His research is centered around scientific visualization. His research interests include hierarchical data structure for large data, uh, parallel and level detail algorithm, and interactive visualization. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jens, from your side, you seem to also to regard artificial intelligence and machine learn, uh, learning to combat the COVID-19 as a challenge. So please tell us how and tell us about the exciting work you do. Hey, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, yes, so I'm going to talk about trials and tribulations when trying to use uh, AI against COVID-19. Um, I was working with a colleague on an AI tool to diagnose pneumonia from chest X-ray images, and we wanted to first uh, diagnose um, normal uh, lungs versus bacterial pneumonia versus viral pneumonia. And after we got this to a reasonable point, uh, we wanted to extend this to assess the severity of uh, COVID-19. At this time, we realized two things. Uh, one is that uh, CAT scans seem to be clinically more relevant for this task than X-ray, because we have more data to work with. And B, there's far less data publicly available than we anticipated. So, <clears throat> if we look at the literature, we find a statement that seems to be paradoxical at first. So, it is concluded that AI has not yet been impactful against COVID-19. Its use is hampered by a lack of data and by too much data. And of course, the lack of data is something that sounds intuitively right. Um, I give you an example here. We have more than 8 million COVID-19 cases and tens of thousands of chest uh, CAT scans and X-rays are probably made daily. Um, on the other hand, what is considered a large data for us is uh, what was released, thankfully, by uh, MOSMED AI. And this consists of barely 1,100 uh, CAT scans, but it's already 11.5 gigabyte. And this is after 90% of the slices have been removed. So a CAT scan is a three-dimensional data set where you have image slices along the body height. And now if you remove slices, then Essentially, you cut out uh, slices like this, and this leads to a loss in resolution. So, and this is a problem for us. Um, the other problem that we have is that uh, the data set's annotations are incomplete. We want to know the risk factors. What is the patient's age? Uh, were there respiratory uh, preconditions? Does the patient suffer from diabetes? And very important, has the patient been intubated? All these are very uh, important factors in coming up with a diagnosis. Now, too much data here is more subtle. This comes in the form of a diversity and wealth of data that doesn't really contribute to the goal or is too large to process, or in the form of too much noisy data that really slows us down when we try to achieve our goals. So now let us assume that after all of this, we have a model, we have trained an AI, and this AI can assess uh, COVID-19 severity. But then we realize that clinical acceptance takes time. So of course, we then get excited. We want this model uh, used in daily routine. And on this figure here, I just have a flow from data to clinical acceptance, and then in the yellow boxes, I have the uh, potential hindrances. And one major hindrance is um, AI mistrust. So AI is treated or seen as this black box, and we don't know exactly why it works, or even worse, when it stops working. So and explainable AI is a young field that tries to open this black box and visualize what's inside so that we understand uh, more what's going on. Most importantly, though, and this is a, a quote that is from a web page that hosts a clinical uh, data set along with the studies and the annotations that are necessary. Please do not claim diagnostic performance of a model without a clinical study. 
this is not a Kaggle competition data set. So we as data scientists, we have this competitive mindset. We um, train a model, we get out a score, and if we're better than everybody else, then we assume that this has to change the world. This has to be out there. But it's very important that before we do that in a clinical setting, we need clinical studies and clinical studies require expert time. And this is a very scarce commodity at the moment because quite frankly, clinical experts are very busy at the moment helping us through this crisis. So then the next question arises, where do I see the benefit of AI? First of all, I think that this uh, current crisis could be the spark or the uh, incentive to do the research to be better equipped for the next pandemic. Um, I see a lot of value in AI in monitoring uh, non-pharmaceutical intervention protocols, such as thermal scanning, detecting if people wear masks and gloves, if they uh, do social distancing, um, autonomous and robotic drug delivery. Um, and I see a lot of value at the periphery of clinical workflows. For instance, the respiratory self-diagnosis that uh, Dr. Samir was talking uh, about, or model simulating COVID-19 spread to make them more accurate to estimate parameters. I also think that uh, a field that is maybe not fully explored yet is a full analysis and assessment of the infodemic, as I nicknamed this. So the uh, the uh, amount of data that's in the new and the news and uh, researchers know that this news announcement and public announcement have an impact on the effectiveness of these non-pharmaceutical interventions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jens. Actually, you you brought together many points uh, in terms of the trust to AI. And as you call it, the infodemic and how and what are the opportunities and challenges. That's a very interesting talk. Thank you. I would also like the audience to go ahead and uh, and write uh, their questions in the question and answers uh, uh, dialogue for the speakers. Uh, we will continue next with Dr. Rayan. Dr. Rayan Ali uh, recently joined HBKU coming from Bournemouth University in the UK. Dr. Ryan's research focus is on providing methods and framework for building a technology that is more human and sensible to user well-being and able to promote a positive behavioral change. Dr. Ryan, at, th at the time of a pandemic, we become uh, attached to the technology, as we all know. More, more than ever, parents are now worried about their kids spending even more time online. Can you tell us what is digital addiction? And can we use those attractive and immersive elements on social media and games in a more positive way? For example, an application for an education or health. So please go ahead with your presentation and give us a lot uh, of your beautiful insights in this field. Okay, well, well thank you. Thank you very much. Can, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, well, well, thank you for the introduction. Indeed, actually, the worry about the usage of technology is now higher than ever. It was always an issue that people are using technology everywhere, and especially children and so on. But then at the time of the pandemic, when, when, when people do not have other options, this question has been revisited, whether we should look at technology as a, a potential for uh, mental health as well, like games, social media, and, and, and so on. So digital addiction as, as a phenomenon is a kind of a new phenomenon, and it is even debated whether we should consider that as an addiction. Indeed, the World Health Organization just recently recognized gaming disorder in 2018, and by that recognition, the World Health Organization is opening the door now for health services to offer a care for those who identify as being game addicts. So digital addiction is a compulsive, impulsive, excessive, and hasty usage of technology, which is associated with harm. So we cannot really say addiction without harm associated with that. The um, good thing about technology is that it can actually go some, uh, some, some, some addictive usage, but at the same time can be used differently. 
So to correct that, so in comparison to tobacco or to cigarettes, for example, a cigarette cannot tell a smoker to stop. But actually, technology is very smart and very interactive and very real time. So it can monitor when a person is using it in a way which can be seen as problematic or excessive or hasty. Like somebody is sharing 10 photos, for example, on Twitter nonstop. But that is a behavior which can be detected through AI, through sentiment analysis, looking at the posts they are having there, and they send them some warning. A cigarette cannot do that. This is a good thing about technology. So I hear from many, many families these days that their children are spending all the time online. Is that really something bad? Can they do something about it? Um, at the time of crisis, actually, that spending more time on technology doesn't mean necessarily a harm. Actually, we all spend more time on, techn on technology. The harm comes from, um, from what you do there. You see, the influence that technology is having on you. For example, when people are exposed to online spaces for a long time, and they are seeing what other colleagues and other friends and other children are, are doing, they become more susceptible to the behavior of others. They may contribute to the spread of fake news. They may become victims of social engineering. Because actually they create a space for themselves, what we call a filter bubble or echo chamber. And they keep, they, they, they basically, they hear what you want to hear and all of that. So there could be a behavior facilitated by the algorithm and by the AI there, which lead people to, um, to impair decision making. By the way, digital addiction, social engineering, fake news, they are all connected topics. So it's ultimately about the impaired decision making. I'm conscious of the time, but actually I'm going to talk about the positive role of technology. There's the same addictive elements, the same elements which influence people's behavior in the wrong way, actually can be used by us in the positive way. The game industry, social media industry are far ahead in the game. They are actually using this technique since decades now. They are not really very, um, we are not exploiting them that much. So recently, the concept of gamification and games and behavioral change has started to be used, for example, in application for fitness. Like you give people goals, you give people rewards, and uh, let, let's say variable rewards, uncertain rewards, so you keep them motivated there. So in our research, actually, we are looking at the positive design of technology to correct the, 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 the deviant behavior, the addictive behavior, to raise conscious, uh, consciousness, to explain the AI as well as, as Jens mentioned in his talk, to explain the AI behind those immersive elements so we build resilience in people. Uh, one example here, and this is just the last example I'm, I'm going to explain on WhatsApp. So many people told us in, in, in our studies, they struggled to finish a WhatsApp conversation. So a small little intervention like putting a calendar in the top of WhatsApp that the other person can see, or showing a sort of uh, hourglass here um, the, to mention that the time you agreed on at the start is actually finishing. That little intervention can help a healthy conversation what's up and nudge people into the correct behavior. Thank you very much, Brian. Very insightful talk and uh, very related to our uh, nowadays use of technology. Thank you. Uh, next is Dr. Uh, Mofak. Dr. Mofak Hosa is a researcher and a social entrepreneur of health informatics in the Arab world. His primary research uh, uh, interests are around the use of information communication technologies for patient empowerment, especially in the area of mental health. Today, Dr. Mofak is presenting an interesting app that he and his team have developed. Uh, so please, Dr. Mofak, can you tell us more about this project, uh, the idea behind it, and how uh, was the development and the evaluation of this uh, interesting application? Thank you, Dr. Dina. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. But before I share my PowerPoint slides, during the COVID-19 uh, crisis, we noticed that, as every other parent as well, that the children were stuck at home and they needed to do something or to work or to do something to keep them occupied. And I noticed my children were starting to draw more. And I thought, you know, if they're drawing all the time, you know, they're making all the, like I have a collection of all these drawings. I'm not sure if you can see them here. They're in the camera. And I was wondering what kind of emotions are they presenting during this time? Look at all these images. And I collected a whole bunch of them. And I thought to myself, since, you know, we're working uh, already in, the, in this area of mental health and the group was working around the area uh, on a project related to this, 
can we harness the the group, the expertise of HBQ and the team to create an app to help parents uh, understand the emotions of their children uh, through art? So what I first did is I actually uh, searched the app store in Google, so before anything, and I could not find an app like, uh, like that. Um, and I thought this would be a great opportunity. We sat with the team and basically uh, uh, we developed this really unique and novel app uh, using artificial intelligence to actually um, give you a sense of the emotions uh, of being at this stage positive or, or, or negative types of emotions. We worked with an art therapist here located in Doha who would take these, act these images and would classify them because we didn't have a, a large uh, many. We had a close to a thousand images that we found online and and locally from uh, schools um, uh, that we put together and we had the algorithm actually uh, help classify them into these positive and negative uh, types of emotions. And now the, the uh, what ISRA stands for Emotion Sensing Recognition app, now you can find it on the app and the actual Google Store for uh, it's only available for now in Qatar. You need a, a, a number to actually download it and to get the uh, link to uh, to open the app. But it's a very simple concept. Um, we cut to very simple. You look, you create a profile for each child. You take with your phone. You just take the uh, you take the image. Uh, you take the uh, shot of the image and the the algorithm. Uh, you know, it's a little wonky sometimes, like every other algorithm, AI, as we get more data and so forth, it'll become stronger and stronger and better, but you get an actual uh, uh, result of this positive or negative emotions. And then the great thing about this app, it just, it's not a one-time capture for each child, but you can monitor them over time, uh, as you can see uh, here on the fourth screen. So it gives you a positive, you take an image, uh, you click on it, it gives you a positive or negative uh, uh, emotions based on the classification of the algorithm. And from that, then you can monitor over time and see the emotions of your child and what's happening over time. Are they more in the positive or negative uh, negative realm? And then after, after that, you can perhaps uh, uh, discuss that if you find an issue, you can discuss that with the uh, school uh, counselors. You can have open a conversation with your child. And the great thing about this app uh, is that it helps um, break those bridges between the parent and the child. And they get they have something that can communicate on. My children now, they, it's funny, actually, every drawing that they do, they're like, Isra app, Isra app, I want to try it. Tell me, positive or negative emotions. And and it's it's funny. So we're enjoying it. I go, what do you think? And she's saying, I think it's positive. Well, let's see what the app says. And we're having this conversation about the art and which is which is beautiful and unique and it just creates this communication between me and my children helps um break that communication barrier or gap that sometimes parents have with their children and i hope that um, other people can we need feedback on this app this is new it's not perfect we plan to do other things with the team uh, uh, with this app to give more categories more information to parents based on art and this is a unique uh, project and I hope people can benefit from it, and especially parents. I'd like to uh, thank the uh, the team, Dr. Zubair Shah, Yunus Atmo, and Nashfa Ali for doing this very interesting uh, uh, and unique work that's unique to HBQ and the HB community. And you can search Isra app on uh, Google or the Apple Store, and please download it. Uh, give us your feedback, and we'd love to hear from you uh, from the community, especially here in Qatar. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Mufak. It's a very interesting app. Me, myself, I downloaded it and, uh, and I found it interesting and I think uh, many of us will find it interesting to, to understand the artwork of children and, and actually, uh, as you said, create some sort of conversation with the children. So with us next is Dr. Tanvir Alam. Dr. Tanvir, uh, primary work has been centered on biomedical discoveries using artificial intelligence techniques uh, using NGS data, his research focusing on non-coding RNAs and their inters uh, interscription regulation to understand how these genes are involved in different diseases. He also worked on protein-protein interaction network, 
which are involved uh, in the cell adhesion and cancer metastasis. Considering the pandemic, Dr. Tanvir, what would a rational treatment plan for a COVID-19 be? And what is the goal of your research work related to the COVID-19? Please go ahead and present your very nice ideas. Thank you, Dr. Dina. Um, for, thanks for asking. We all know that we are not facing uh, the coronavirus for the first time. In the last two decades, we have faced this coronavirus for at least twice. Back in 2003, we faced uh, SARS, and back 2012, we faced against the Mars. And in, back, uh, in 2019 and 20, we are facing the novel coronavirus, which caused the COVID-19 pandemic. Regarding your first question uh, about the treatment plan, in, in my opinion, and based on the expert opinions, uh, we think we should think about a short to midterm plan and as well as long-term plan. For short to midterm plan, um, we should uh, focus on the drug repurposing, which means that we should consider all the existing FDA approved drugs and to check uh, their efficacy and safety profiles against the COVID-19 patients across different severity level. Um, and this would save our time because uh, discovery of a new drug takes lots of time. In terms of a uh, long-term goal, in my opinion, uh, the vaccination would be uh, the ultimate goal for the scientific community across the world, though this is the most uh, challenging and uh, at the same time, it would be the most effective, in my opinion, to combat this um, pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. Now, if I uh, want to present how scientific communities are uh, treating this coronavirus for the treatment plan of uh, the COVID-19, here I just highlight a very high level picture of this uh, novel coronavirus. And you, you will see on the right panel, this novel coronavirus is a positive sense, single stranded RNA virus. And it has only 29 proteins. Compared to human, we have more than 20,000 20, proteins. And you can see that all the researchers across the world are uh, try to demystify the complexity of only these 29 proteins. And you will find in this, among these 29 proteins, we have uh, four structural proteins on the right side, we call the C-terminal side, and we have um, 16 uh, non-structural proteins, and we have roughly nine um, uh, accessory ORFs, or open reading trends. And interestingly, uh, most of these proteins are involved in multifarious activities which means they can invade uh, the host in that, in, in our case, we are the host, human and the host, and they invade the host and, and they can control uh, the human cell cycle, they can interfere the immune response, so they can control our whole system. So uh, to combat that uh, as a treatment plan, we need to find a solution uh, to uh, demystify the mechanism of these proteins, and to identify the drugs which can control the activities of these proteins. Here is an example on the left side. I just highlight one of the proteins. So we are working on these and other proteins. Now, coming back to your second question uh, about um, the kind of research activities we are working on as a treatment plan for the COVID-19. We are trying to cover two aspects for the treatment of COVID-19 patients. In the first project, we are uh, exploring the existing drugs, FDA-approved drugs, and check their efficacy profile and safety profile against and their interaction with the viral protein. And we have uh, identified some of the viral proteins um, with, um, we, we consider them as a, a stable protein because we find a minimal variation on their sequence, which is a primary requirement to be considered as a candidate for the drug target. And then we are checking the drugs against these proteins. And our hope is, is and the goal is to control the activities of these viral proteins using the existing FGF drugs. 
as part of the second project on the right panel, we are trying to understand the underlying mechanism between the viral protein and the host protein. As we already mentioned that these viral proteins invade the host immune systems. So it is very crucial to uh, understand the underlying biochemical and biophysical aspects that is controlling the, this interaction between viral and host protein. And uh, for this purpose, uh, we, are, um, uh, we are exploring all the interaction computationally. And with the help of our collaborators, we are also um, uh, validating some of this interaction in HPQ. So combining these two approach, we are trying to under, uh, explore uh, the available uh, FDA approved drugs. And at the same time, we are planning to design novel antiviral agents. And uh, until and unless we uh, found a, in, in globally, we find an effective therapeutic solution to, ch to fight the COVID-19, we all had to uh, follow the WHO guidelines for the non-therapeutic uh, measurement like uh, social distancing, uh, social distancing, then um, contact tracing or other guidelines prescribed by the WHO. So um, that is what we are doing uh, from our side at HPKU to for the treatment plan of COVID-19. Thank you, Dr. Dina. Thank you very much, Dr. Sambia. It's very nice how you presented the, the, the protein uh, structure of the virus and something I didn't know before this presentation. So thank you very much. You. The next speaker uh, with us is Dr. Marwa Karaki. Dr. Karaki is a passionate about conducting research that will have a direct impact on people. She believes that human data hold immense hidden potential that needs to be unlocked using advanced data analytics and artificial intelligence techniques for a better progression of medicine, health, and human life. Dr. Marwa, tell us why do you think the COVID uh, uh, virus has taken over the world so rapidly? And uh, tell us more about the solution you are proposing to control them. Okay. And thank you, Dr. Dina, for the introduction. Um, so one reason that can be attributed to why the COVID-19 pandemic has spread so widely is because uh, it found us, you know, vulnerable and unprepared for such a pandemic. And this is mainly because the majority of the population around the world, they didn't understand how simple precautionary measures can really go a long way in limiting their exposure to the virus and decreasing the spread of the virus. And this is quite understandable because uh, the majority of the population, especially in this in the past generation, haven't really experienced a serious pandemic like the COVID-19 one. Um, so, despite the different efforts taken by the governments all over the world that you know promote social distancing, wearing personal protective equipment, many people simply didn't comply because they didn't see the correlation between how their behavior and complying to such measurement would decrease their exposure to the virus. Uh, so in order to create more compliance to such, you know, precautionary measures, we developed an app called Wukaya, which in Arabic means prevention, to help uh, users, you know, monitor their behavior and then decrease their exposure to the COVID-19 virus. So uh, just to discuss a little bit Wukaya, best practices in order to decrease someone's exposure are not always straightforward, especially when it comes to, you know, a pandemic or, you know, the COVID-19 virus. And what Wikaya is aimed to do is it wants to change a user's behavior step by step by first monitoring their behavior and then providing them some you know, uh, feedback on what they can do to change their behavior to ultimately reduce their risk of uh, contracting the COVID-19 virus. So essentially, you can think of Wikaya as a virtual advisor that helps you decrease what we call uh, the exposure index to the COVID-19 pandemic by monitoring your behavior and then giving you personalized feedback. So how do we... Um, calculate this exposure index. You know, the exposure index, we define it the probability that you've been exposed somehow to the COVID-19 uh, virus. Uh, so we do it this by two ways. First, we do a data collection from the user's smartphone, and we collect two types of features. First is location. We want to know where the person is, where is he's going or she's going, and what places are they visiting. And we do this by looking at the GPS of the user. So we track their location and identify what location is it. Is it a shopping mall? Are they going to a certain health clinic or a hospital, to their work, to different residential areas, you know, visiting friends and family? The second data that we're collecting is, you know, how many people did this user come into close proximity with? 
And we do this by looking at Bluetooth, the Bluetooth sensor in the smartphone. So the reason we chose Bluetooth is because the range is up to you know, 10 meters, which is an appropriate range, because if a user comes into contact with someone that's you know, greater in distance from them, more than 10 meters, the probability of you know, contracting an illness from that person is relatively low. So using this Bluetooth sensor, it can identify the Bluetooth IDs of people around them. And then it can also measure the time that they spend with these people. And it can also identify, you know, the model can identify whether this is a Bluetooth for a smartphone or other Bluetooth sensors. And then this data is uh, collected and then analyzed by a model. And then your exposure index is calculated through your location and the number of people you come in contact with. And then it suggests, you know, the, the application will suggest certain personalized ways that you can change your behavior uh, to reduce your exposure index. And now the interesting thing and the attractive feature about Lutaya is that it's privacy preserving, meaning that we do not share any of the data uh, with other than the user. All the data is housed into the smartphone locally. It's not stored on a remote server. So it reduces, you know, breaking the potential for, you know, leaked data or, you know, an attack on the data or some, something of the sort. So just to go over the application, we have here um, some snapshots of the applica mobile application. So the first two here on the, at the beginning, they're just introductory slides, you know, talking about the COVID-19 pandemic and what the aim of the application is. And then we ask the user to, you know, track where their home location is. And then finally, once all of these initial steps are done, we have the main screen of the application, which includes four tabs, including exposure assessment, social distancing, recent trips, and then a weekly overview, which I will discuss in the next slides. So if a user wants to understand what's their exposure index based on their behavior, they would press the exposure assessment you know, tab, and then they will be able to view what their exposure index. So for example, this user, his exposure index is high. Uh, so if he would like to get recommendations on how he could you know, potentially reduce his exposure, then he would click on the bottom button, and then he will be directed to a page where then he's giving you know, some uh, personalized recommendation of what he can do to reduce his exposure index. And then if a user wants to understand, you know, why his or her uh, exposure index is quite high or why it's low, then they can look at the social distancing and then the recent trips tabs. So for their social distancing, it really provides the user with the number of people that they came into close proximity with. And it divides these contacts, you know, in different risk levels. So including risky, moderate risk, and then normal. And the risk groups are categorized based on the amount of time the user was spending with this person and where the location. So was I spending a long time in a hospital setting with a particular subject or was I, you know, at my home, did people come visit me in my home and there was a prolonged exposure? So these are divided in different risk groups. Uh, also in the recent trips app here, so the user is able to see all of his recent trips taken within that day, including the time visited, the location, the time duration, and then as well, these visited locations, you know, are also organized into different risk categories. And then last but not least, now if a user wants to go and see, you know, his overall behavior and how his behavior was correlated to his exposure index, he would go on to the weekly overview and he's able to see throughout the week how his behavior and his decisions to go out or to engage in, or to engage in social distancing, how that is correlated either directly or indirectly to his exposure index. And he'd be able to click on each of these buttons to get more information on that day's statistics and why the exposure index is such. So, this application, our hopes is it would go a, a long way to help users really understand how simple precautionary measures and simple things can really limit their exposure to the COVID-19 virus and beyond COVID-19. So some people have, you know, weakened immune systems for different kinds of illnesses such as cancer. So they can take this into account and, you know, take precautionary measures that's specific to their, you know, specific condition to, uh, you know, in general, promote a more healthy lifestyle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. It's a very interesting project. Actually, it's how these uh, uh, modern days technologies and innovation could go beyond, as, as you said, beyond uh, the uh, the COVID-19 and, and help uh, with enhancing the lifestyle of patients with specific disease and compromised immune system. Thank you very much, Dr. Amarwa. 
I will hand in uh, to Professor Ryan Ali uh, for the question and answer session. So, uh, Dr. Ryan, please go ahead in handling the question and answer session. Thank you. Uh, we got a couple of questions. One of the questions is about really the certainty of the algorithms. So the question is that we every day discover new variables that might affect the outcome. Uh, how can we sure that our decision, that the decisions the algorithm is 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 given, giving in the end is accurate, and there are no counterexamples. I think this is a, a question which applies to a couple of research here. So perhaps Dr. Tanvir, you would like to answer. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Ryan. Um, uh, the type of research I'm doing, yeah, uh, for example, in terms of drug discovery, if you look at um, history, historical evidence for this pandemic, at the very beginning, uh, some drugs are prescribed in different clinical setups. And over time, we found that some drugs are effective at the moderate or low severity, severely ill patient, then it was not effective for other groups. And so this is part of uh, the research and this, this virus and this situation is uh, quite new to us. So, I mean, we are exploring the opportunities we have. So this is quite uh, normal in any kind of research activities that we will see and evaluate and ultimately we will reach a goal. Well, thank you. That actually leads us um, normally to the second question, which is about trust. So, Jens, you talked about trust. Uh, we would like people to, to start to trust AI, or maybe we don't want them to start to trust AI and to be conscious of the limitations in it. Can you elaborate on that point? Sorry. So, um, the main issue is that, and this is fundamental to understand, it's, it's very simple. Um, with AI, we try to predict the future. But we try to predict the future learning from history. And this is where this, uh, this black box comes from. This is where this, this uh, mistrust comes from. Now, what we do is we try to uh, incorporate as many factors as we can find, for instance, into these uh, uh, severity uh, uh, prediction models. But whenever new parameters, new annotations are available, um, some of our data set becomes invalidated because we don't have uh, these annotations there. And so in that case, you kind of go back to the data and you, uh, you care for your data and you make sure that everything is consistent. Now, as far as trust goes, is we really need these, uh, these clinical studies. We really need first to uh, look at um, what the AI looks at, for instance. We know that the convolutional neural networks, they see the world very differently from us and maybe even from, uh, from physicians. So the first step is you actually use visualizations that highlight where interesting regions are, and then you try to understand if that makes sense, if this is a feature um, that the AI should be looking at. But ultimately, you have to use uh, clinical studies to answer all these questions. Thank you. Um, one question is about inter, inter, the interdisciplinary nature of, of this research. So uh, anyone would like to comment on that, whether we as computer, com computer scientists basically are able to do that alone or we have to also engage with other communities as well? If anyone would like to answer this question. Yes, please. Yeah, I can, yeah. Mm. So uh, sometimes there is uh, there's a lot of discipline can be uh, can be interacted. For example, mathematics, uh, study, social sciences, and computer science. For example, if, if you want to estimate uh, the pandemic, how the, how the propagation is. So usually what we need in order to better estimate the future. So usually we say we need to understand the past. So usually we need to understand how the society interacts in order to get the best model. When we have the best model, there is a lot of parameters. We need to estimate those parameters. So there is interaction with statistics, uh, dynamic system, uh, advanced mathematics in order to do uh, the better estimation, how to compare between different models, how the model can work for certain society and doesn't work for other society. But at the bottom line, at the end, 
prediction is still a challenging question for research until now. Okay, thank you. Okay. Another question about the set of stakeholders. So if we take the app of Dr. Marwa or Dr. Muwafa, where do you envisage the, the app is going to be used? Is it for the public audience or it can be used in a specific context? Okay, so I can uh, start answering. So for the Wakaya app, uh, ideally what would be nice is uh, to integrate it within the Ihtiraz application. Because if you look at the purposes of these two applications, they're quite different. Uh, Wakaya will help in user behavioral analysis and changing. And anyways, Ihtiraz is collecting the same data that uh, Wakaya is being uh, using, including Bluetooth and uh, you know, GPS location data. So you know, the ideal, uh, ideally, it would be integrated within that uh, application. Now, if we're going to go beyond the COVID-19 pandemic, it can be installed as a separate uh, application. So people who, you know, inshallah, after the COVID-19 ends, you know, people who have compromised uh, immune systems and they would like to look how their behavior might affect their, you know, health in the future, they could use such an application. Thank you, uh, Dr. Marwa. As for the ISLA app, we're hoping that the, uh, we're hoping that the public is able to download and use the app and to give us feedback, especially um, parents, uh, school counselors, probably they can encourage parents to use it. Um, as I mentioned, you know, with any algorithm that we use or that you develop, nothing is perfect. Even in the best algorithms from the Googles to the Netflix to anywhere in the world, there's always something that is off uh, or, or not right. But with more data and more feedback, what you can do is develop and give better predict, uh, predictions and better results that will actually help the parents uh, uh, understand the emotional state through the art uh, that the children are producing. So I think that you know, with any app, you start out of a kind of a, as a base, especially with all these algorithms, because they work on data and the more data you have, the better the predictions are. And then over time, you collect data, you refine, you reevaluate, and in time, you got pretty pretty good results and and you cannot now we have only two class two and positive and negative emotions but in the future we can have more about you know what you know uh sad happy anger fear and hopefully we can have these highlight you know the different areas where the negative and positive emotions are showing on that particular image so we hope you know as with as i mentioned with any app we're still in the beginning stages collecting feedback start getting some more information uh, uh, from people, especially some of the feedback that we got, you know, if if a, if an image looks positive, for example, and you're getting negative results, why is that? What what is the algorithm doing? Um, and we need to explain that and and show why. And that's what we're working on right now in the in the launch and the second phase. Now we're we actually created a survey. Everyone that actually downloaded the app will be sending them a survey to give us feedback and hopefully over time we can begin to develop develop it so the public engaging the public is very important and we believe we cannot do it or develop any app without the public input and feedback that they provide so thank you well, which is a notion of citizen science so the citizen and uh, participate in science um we got a question maybe for dr zubair whether we can correct fake news uh, online so we have some automated mechanisms in order to stop the spread of fake news and perhaps correct them uh, online. If you want to comment on that, Dr. Zubair. <clears throat> yes, they, uh, there are many efforts, uh, um, uh, like there are many algorithms that can work to estimate the cred credibility of the information that is shared uh, through social media. So our algorithms can kind of uh, estimate uh, the credibility and whether it's a fake news or whether it's a it's a correct news. Uh, there are some organizations as well which actually take those uh, information and kind of provide the validity. But from AI perspective, yes, uh, some of the algorithms uh, are really uh, um, able to kind of predict uh, misinformation. Uh, and then once it is predicted, then of course the the science behind the 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 dissemination of the fake news is a different thing, like how it spreads and how many people it reach. 
but uh, kind of uh, in terms of predictions, the algorithms are able to kind of predict. I'm, I'm done with question and answer. Over to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Ryan. Thank you, uh, everyone, for the very insightful discussion. I myself enjoyed it, and I hope that the, the attendees have enjoyed uh, the uh, discussion. Uh, so uh, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for everyone who have attended the session. Uh, we hope that you have enjoyed our uh, presentations, our discussions, and uh, they have enriched you uh, somehow in some way. So thank you, every everyone, and hope to meet you again, inshallah. Thank you.